Great. Uh, so it's a couple of minutes past noon here in, uh, in the UK. So good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I hope that's fine that, that we start. Uh, so my name is uh, Alberto Square. I'm director of SAFE in South Suez University of London. And I'm delighted here to have organized this event together with our, our guest. So the topic is on the way to post-pandemic economic and financial recovery. The idea is that many countries, as we know, still struggle with COVID-19 pandemic. Some of them are very cautiously lifting up lockdown restrictions, but especially the focus here is with economic and financial heritage from this, uh, this pandemic. So the drop of business activity, increase of budget deficits, the surge of public debt, uh, these are all our features of a challenging scenarios for policymakers, central bankers, for the public in the future. I'm delighted to have you here with us today, Sebastian Cochat, a senior advisor to the EU Parliament and G G20 presidencies. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you, uh, as, as anticipated, uh, I can start with a few questions and then we can open the floor to all the participants. Just a very simple one. I just introduced you very quickly, Sebastian. If you'd like to say more about yourself and to share something about your background expertise and the current activity. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a French. Uh, however, I uh, lived uh, abroad, I mean, outside of France, I think, uh, probably like 80 or 90 percent of my life. I was uh, living probably like in 15 different countries in several continents. So uh, I would say I'm quite uh, de facto globalized. Uh, I was trained as an economist and econometrician. Uh, however, I worked, uh, I was a little bit like in the forecasting uh, at the Ministry, French Minister of Finance, but I uh, worked in policy making uh, most of my life. Uh, whatever within uh, public administrations or international organizations or uh, as a government affairs for, uh, for banks, for uh, a French bank and then a Greek bank during the Greek. Uh, of the uh, latest financial crisis of 2015. And um, as you mentioned, uh, I was advising a member of European Parliament uh, these past years, uh, and uh, I am currently in Saudi Arabia working for the uh, G20 uh, presidency by Saudi Arabia this year. So I'm physically uh, calling you from uh, Riyadh right now. In some time uh, soon, you will have the sound the call for prayer. <laughs> you will probably hear uh, on the uh, video. Um, so I think uh, that's it. I'm 50 years old, so I already have more than uh, 25 years of career. And I saw many financial crises already. But you can get through it. Waiting for the next one. Well, thank you for sharing this, and probably you can say more in a few minutes about what you think is very special of this crisis. Because the first question then to, to progress is uh, this pandemic has shaken the world in ways we are still, which has not still fully manifested. So what do you think the main legacy of this pandemic will be on countries' economies and finance? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, uh, it is uh, it's quite, right now I would say that we are still in uh, in total uncertainty. Uh, your question is very relevant and actually uh, like uh, you know we are working for uh, ministers of finance and central bank governors and they are uh, impatient. Uh, they are like uh, uh, politicians, uh, top technocrats and they want already to think about the exit strategies and about the lessons uh, learned from the crisis but we are still deep in the crisis and, uh, and we do not know yet actually if we reach the bottom or not. Personally, in terms of, uh, of it, purely epidemics, that's a personal opinion, uh, not a professional one, but uh, I think we are not to expect uh, the so-called second wave. Um, like the virus is uh, strictly following where we have precise data of contamination in countries, it's uh, precisely following a ghost curve. Uh, we saw a very clear ghost curve, for, ghost curve you know, like this uh, bell-shaped curve, uh, uh, we saw a perfect shape in Italy, for instance, in Germany, in Spain. We see a nice ghost curve in uh, in the UK uh, as well. In countries which are of bigger, I would say, continental shape, like the US, Russia, um, the shape of the, the curve is not as nice because actually there is like a multiplicity of uh, ghost curves in several states uh, and you don't have the same uh, temporality of them. So it seems there is a second wave, but actually it's the same, uh, which is uh, multiplied. So basically the epidemics and actually uh, 
like uh, epidemiologists were forecasting uh, in France, for instance, that end of May, basically 99% of people who should have been uh, contaminated would have, have already been contaminated. So it was time to stop the lockdown. So again, I think we will not have second wave. But still, we do not know, actually, it's very difficult to uh, appreciate the full impact of what we got already. Uh, it's a little bit difficult uh, to um, estimate the uh, so-called uh, hysteresis effect, what will be like the differential effect on societies and economies, uh, according to the type of jobs, etc. And again, there is still this uh, Damocles word of like possibility of return of lockdowns, if you raise a little return of the virus. So all this said, uh, this is definitely the worst crisis in terms of pure, pure statistics, I would say. Uh, but the uh, world experience uh, since uh, economic statistics exist. Uh, I would say since 200 years, like let's not speak of 18th century because there were still like plagues, uh, events. Uh, but uh, in the past uh, 200 years, in time of peace, that's definitely the worst economic crisis uh, we got. Uh, the, for instance, uh, like the global financial crisis of uh, uh, 2007, 8 until the Eurozone crisis of uh, 2010, 11, uh, 12. Uh, I mean, the global uh, GDP uh, at the worst was uh, in minus, uh, I would say, 2% something for like two quarters consecutive. Uh, right now, only the first, um, like the first quarter of 2020, we were at minus 3%. And for the global economy. And uh, for the second quarter, uh, we will be probably at something like minus 10, 11 percent. Just two, these two quarters already totally dwarf the global financial crisis. Uh, so it, indeed, the impacts will be, uh, will be long lasting. Uh, like uh, even the most optimist uh, forecast consider, you know, there was all this debate about the V shape. Uh, uh, recovery, like people were saying, uh, look, we are locking down everyone, but as soon as we reopen, everything will start like before. But of mm -hmm. course, it is not the case uh, because you have like uh, sectors which will be terribly impacted, uh, most obviously, uh, like transportation, tourism, uh, collective entertainment, uh, like uh, restaurants, etc. I mean, people uh, people have, will have different consum consuming patterns, and uh, and basically, as soon as you stop the lockdowns. Like things start fast in some sectors, but in some others it will take uh, years to come back to some uh, normal level if it comes back. Basically, the most optimistic uh, uh, forecast uh, for the global economy uh, basically are telling us that uh, at the beginning of 2022, we will still be lower, uh, we will still have a lower global GDP that we were having at the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. And this is again like a macro view, I would say. But if you uh, like detail, uh, if you enter into sectors, and if you uh, enter into, uh, I would say, slices of the population of the people, like uh, according to their qualification, type of job, etc., some will be in very uh, difficult situation. Basically, uh, like we saw during the lockdown, like uh, you, uh, me, and our, uh, our listeners today, uh, we can. Uh, can work on a remote, remote basis. But people who were working in factories, they could not do uh, remote working. People who were already, I would say, in the less wealthy parts of societies were the most, uh, most impacted. Uh, and this, uh, like, and like, for instance, people who work in a bar, and a restaurant, etc., who change up regularly, uh, gig economy, etc., these ones were the most uh, impacted. So for them, it will last less long will have like a kind of big recovery. But for people who, have, who are working in small, medium enterprises, who got bankrupt, or who will get soon bankrupt because of the lockdown, uh, for them it will be very, in some times, uh, some cases very difficult to find, uh, find back some economic footing. Mm -hmm. so all in all, I would say there will be an hysteresis effect. Uh, it, will, it will not come back like it was before, uh, unfortunately. And uh, then, um, it will all depend on the, I think, on the public policies which should be taken. Uh, and the resolution, I mean, the resolve of these policies, I and mean, if they are, uh, I would say, decisive enough, and if the ideology is not like impeaching them to, uh, to achieve what they should uh, achieve. Uh, I think we really should uh, continue to push for a very uh, strong uh, support 
I would say, continued shielding of the, uh, of the household and companies by the government and central banks. And this uh, support should not be uh, tapered, should not be withdrawn too early. Mm -hmm. We have to be very cautious that, like, uh, I would say, uh, uh, although liberal uh, thinking is not making us make the same mistake globally that we did at the last financial crisis, when basically, uh, basically government started to consolidate their public finances and, uh, and started to be focused on debt reduction too early. Uh, and central banks started to raise rates and, uh, and uh, stop uh, asset uh, purchasing, etc. I don't know if I answer your question. <laughs> well, thank you. I may just have a small uh, follow-up question. As a, uh, if I try and distinguish in between the real economy, where I believe uh, we will experience a very slow, painful recovery, also because of all the rigidities to reallocate the skills and capital, for instance, from one, one industry to another one. Then if we think uh, for a while about the financial sector instead, financial sector comes to mind that uh, it can be much more exposed to sudden swings. So yes. do, do you think within the, the, the uncertainty in the future there could be additional risks posed by further like a short financial crisis because of like accumulation of losses in companies or banks uh, and then suddenly they can pop up uh, in a very dramatic, dramatic way? Yes, I mean definitely you're touching a very sensitive point because uh, basically uh, we observe I would say uh, kind of like exuberant financial markets. Uh, if we compare, to use this old uh, qualification from uh, Greenspan uh, at the time, uh, like world economy was kind of normal. Because I would say like, uh, even at the very beginning of uh, globalization, you know, as it is now, uh, 20 years ago, but uh, uh, the financial market seemed to be right now in total disconnection with the real economy. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when countries are like minus 10, 15%, of GDP for 2020, like uh, like UK, France, Italy, Spain, they will be between um, 10 and 15 percent of GDP. And you have uh, basically financial market in these uh, countries, and in the US as well. Uh, US is still in the middle of the pandemic, and you have basically, I think, the Standard and Poor's uh, S&P index uh, is back at the level of before the crisis right now. So if you look in detail, you see that uh, that you have actually like the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, index which is uh, like minus five or seven percent of its level before the COVID crisis but you see that the Nasdaq which is uh, like more oriented towards the new technologies uh, is uh, already higher than it was at the beginning of the year which in the current situation of the global economy and um, of each actually uh, of each individual economy is uh, totally insane. So it seems that um, we have here a kind of bubble. And uh, it's, it shows actually what uh, the crisis is doing right now to the global economy. Uh, you know, like uh, there is a statistic I found fascinating and scary, uh, which uh, I think is established by uh, an NGO uh, called Oxfam, uh, kind of serious, serious one, like the, the each year they calculate the number of people, uh, the richest people on earth, how many of them are owning as much assets as um, the poorest half of mankind? Mm. So basically, uh, let's say that the, like the poorest half of mankind represent uh, like 4 billion people. I mean, it's more like 3.9, but let's say 4. Uh, you, have, uh, you had last year, like 15 people were as rich in terms of total assets as the four billion billion poorest people on earth, and this number was like uh, like three four years ago it was like fifty people. So we went from fifty to fifteen. In like five years you will have five guys, who will or ladies I don't know, but uh, well it's guys actually, but uh, who will uh, actually own who will be as rich or richer let's say than uh, four billion uh, poorest people on earth. And this is what is doing the crisis right now, because we have this uh, very legitimate and needed intervention of government and central banks. And especially central banks are expanding their balance sheet and uh, bringing massive support to the economy through the banks, uh, through supporting the companies. In some countries, through supporting directly the households, but ultimately it's not, it is not the most common case. And 
basically goes uh, among other places, but it goes especially in uh, in the stock market. And we have on one hand, one hand you have like listed companies basically got okay with the support. While the SMEs, the non-listed companies, the real economy, with the lockdown, they lost everything. And these ones, are, it's much more difficult for the central banks to reach them, to support them through the crisis. It's much more difficult for the government to reach small entities and households and individuals than to reach, uh, than like basically give a big amount of money to a big airline company or a car company. Mm -hmm. And you have this, uh, I think the crisis is unfortunately, we speak a lot about big, uh, I think we could uh, perhaps touch upon this issue uh, uh, during our call, but. Uh, like one of the effects of uh, of the crisis is to accelerate this concentration of wealth in little in small number of hands while the major like majority of the popul world population is getting impoverished so it's increasing i would say the bad, bad effects of uh, globalization yeah. uh, thank you very much for this note uh, sebastian is uh, they nicely related to the to the next question uh, i have in mind which refers to government policies. So the governments uh, will, it's quite clear, they will experience budget deficits, level of public debt, like they never saw uh, before, since a decade or probably centuries ago, and uh, probably they will stay for, for some time into the future. So what do you think, uh, how do you think all these will affect the roles of governments and their fiscal policies? In the short term, uh, what's the fiscal space they have to do anything to help the economies? And then in the medium long term, how to ease the burden of public debt, for instance? Well, I think it's one of the good aspects of the crisis. One of the good externalities is that uh, I would say the ideological barrier to the issues of uh, public spending and debt kind of collapsed. And uh, basically, you know, in, especially in Europe, uh, in, uh, in Eurozone, because the UK used to be in Europe, but not in the Eurozone. So you had some like budgetary rules uh, as well, but you didn't have this uh, straight jacket of the Eurozone uh, uh, rules. But like uh, there was, uh, especially in Eurozone, but globally, there, there was this uh, so-called uh, old or liberal Washington consensus ideology where basically government should uh, reduce its uh, impact on the economy and should uh, basically uh, like uh, reduce its uh, uh, spending in share of GDP, and you have actually the debt was uh, the debt level was instrumentalized to protect, but actually there was no money anymore in the public treasury. So because of the debt, uh, states need to cut spendings. But to be honest, this was purely ideology because um, these um, spending cuts were actually dismantling the welfare uh, state uh, of the post-war. Uh, post-war uh, economies, uh, basically, uh, to make it short, like uh, after 1945, you had like uh, the Western societies on one hand and the uh, uh, Soviet-led societies on the other hand, and each, each like uh, country on the West, like especially in European countries, they were having actually a quite big uh, chunk of their citizens voting for the local Communist Party. So basically, uh, in this pre-globalization era of the post-1945 times, like um, the governments, uh, like everything was optimistic, I would say, and governments were focusing on making their citizens happy so they don't start to vote for the Communist Party, to avoid that the Communist Party uh, get into power. And uh, they put in place like health uh, insurance, uh, pensions, uh, uh, like, uh, like uh, People were employed for life in the same companies, etc. So, like I would say, life was kind of happier before. And then the uh, USSR collapsed, and there was not uh, this competition between the two systems anymore. So it's when, like, uh, the first globalization started, like uh, basically a free movement of capital, like uh, all uh, um, like capital accounts of all countries are totally open. Like you can uh, send money anywhere. So, like, basically, production started to shift abroad to have lower cost to go to uh, the emerging markets, uh, I mean, emerging countries. Uh, China started uh, to raise uh, as the uh, uh, like main factory for the whole world, etc. And, uh, and basically, uh, it was not needed anymore to spend so much, to redistribute so much money through uh, the citizens. So like they used the pretext of the public debt to cut into this welfare. 
And uh, but actually, as as much as we were like dismantling the welfare in counterparts, we were actually reduc reducing the taxes for the most uh, rich part of the citizens. It was a pretext, but anyway, they could relocate their wealth somewhere else. So let's don't ask them to uh, to pay anything, so they don't go somewhere else. That was the logic, I would say. At the same time, you had uh, this like uh, aggressive tax optim optimization, which is uh, uh, honestly like. Uh, it's a bloodbath for uh, especially European countries. Uh, you have all these uh, digital uh, multinational US companies uh, like Amazon, Google, uh, Apple, uh, uh, Apple, for instance, uh, the phone maker. Uh, European Commission calculated that in 2014, their effective uh, tax rate on their profits for the whole European Union was 0.0005% of their profit. They don't pay taxes. In Europe, and they are like uh, having billions, I mean, tens of billions of uh, hundreds of billions actually of profit on the European market. And we are not paying any tax in France, uh, Italy, uh, Spain, Germany, etc. So you had this uh, like pretext of the high debt to cut public spendings, going to the less wealthy part of the population, while the multinationals were not paying taxes anymore, and the rich individuals were basically expatriating, not paying much tax locally, and in any case expatriating their money anywhere because of this free movement of capital. So I would say the debt is a, is a false problem. When you consider countries which have their full uh, economic sovereignty, like Japan, Japan has like a, something like 250% of GDP, uh, the debt, the Japanese public debt, represent 250% of uh, Japanese GDP, but it is not considered as uh, a concern uh, because uh, basically uh, first like household in Japan buy a lot of it and because uh, Japanese central banks is buying the, what is needed to be bought in order to avoid any like uh, going um, uh, astray. I mean, uh, so if you have, if you have like basically for a country who has a control of its uh, central bank, uh, it's uh, extremely easy to monetize the debt. It's what everyone does. The US does it, UK does it, Japan does it. So only countries which are under this like ideological pressure are forbidden to do it, like Eurozone countries. But probably some uh, like, uh, I mean, not probably, I mean, uh, like countries under IMF program cannot do it and et cetera, et cetera. So there is uh, one of the effects of the crisis is to have like uh, broken this, uh, this like uh, consensus that uh, debt is something you cannot touch, uh, that central banks are forbidden to help their government by buying the debt, etc. No, it's massively done. And I think it will continue to be massively done. So the debt is on the medium long term is, and even short term is not a problem because the central banks just print money to buy it. Yeah. In a context where having such a terrible, uh, dire situation of the economy, there's no inflation risk at all. Inflation is a pretext, it's another pretext to uh, forbid the two central banks to help their, uh, to support their government by buying the debt. Yeah. Thank you very much for this note, uh, which I fully subscribe personally. But as you mentioned, the role of central banks and the Eurozone, uh, I can't avoid uh, one last question at least uh, before opening the, the floor for other questions. So as, as we know, in the, within the European Union, there have been and there are still quite a lot of issues and discussions concerning the ways in which uh, the European Union can support member states in the recovery in the pandemics and especially the role of European Central Bank. Here, I apologize with some participants if we get into a bit more technicalities, but uh, you can help us to better understand, uh, for instance, the role of this uh, um, ruling from the German Federal Constitutional Court of Karlsruhe concerning a uh, proportionality principle, uh, which does affect the participation of member states and central banks uh, to the bond purchase uh, programs uh, launched by the, the European Central Bank. This is uh, something fairly technical, but which may have important consequences uh, in a couple of months uh, into the future. So Sebastian, it's, I know it's a very technical and difficult, tricky issue, but if you can help explain first uh, to participants uh, what, it, what this means and uh, how, do you th how do you see, therefore, could be the, the future for the role of uh, EU, European Central Bank, uh, uh, Eurozone monetary system? So the euro is uh, 
like as you know, is a monetary union, so it's a common currency for uh, currently 19, uh, 19 states, different states, and uh, and the euro is like a, is a purely political construction. Uh, it is not something which is, I would say, economically natural. It's a man-made, and uh, I would say the closest comparison you find you can find to the eurozone construction is uh, something probably you have to go to the Soviet Union to see this, like I would say. Man, man, power, will, trying to, like, uh, force, like, economic forces to enter into some ideological uh, construction. The euro is something in itself which could potentially make uh, sense in with two, pre, uh, pre, the first one, you have in these 19 countries, you should have an economy which is totally synchronized. You should have economy which uh, basically are fully integrated and uh, are basically at the same moment of the cycle and function in the same way with the same level of uh, of uh, taxation, same level of uh, cost of production, uh, like the uh, same level of um, like uh, job market, etc. You should have economies like fully integrated to have a common currency. And of course, it is not the case. And the economies of member states are. Uh, are widely diverging. And the second precondition you should have is that this uh, common currency should be basically going hand in hand with a common uh, common fi public finances, budgetary ministry of finance function. Uh, you cannot have like a, as a, like a, a currency without having an integrated uh, uh, budget at the level of the 19 member states. And as you know, we don't have a common taxation at all. You have countries who basically try to steal uh, the fiscal base of uh, overs, and we we, can, we don't have at all. Uh, like uh, countries are widely diverging in their uh, uh, public finances, and uh, as I said, economies uh, are absolutely out of sync in the eurozone. So why are we in this situation? Because uh, in the 1980s, at uh, this moment, where actually it was visible that the uh, that the USSR will economically collapse and politically collapse, like. Uh, Globalization started to put in place its, uh, I would say, its uh, structures, and uh, and uh, Germany was one of the countries who were uh, expected to be part of this uh, financial and uh, production globalization. And they actually were pushing to have uh, to have the free movement of capital without the European Union, and uh, and they actually uh, got it with the uh, 1986. Uh, uh, Act Unique, which was creating the internal market with like uh, total uh, freedom of circulation of goods and services and total circulation of uh, of uh, capital, uh, and this was what uh, Germany wanted. But the French leaders at the time, it was uh, Mitterrand, and, uh, and uh, they basically these guys were not uh, extremely, uh, they were like uh, from the past century very much, and they were not into macroeconomics. And, uh, and they were having this idea that uh, uh, they were focusing on getting like, a, getting kind of like a, a piece of uh, the Graal, which was seen as the strength of the German uh, currency. And they wanted basically, they were ready to give up, give up anything. So again, like uh, because of this like free movement of capital, uh, without harmonization of taxation, uh, you had like a massive disindustrialization of France. Like uh, in Germany and France, like industry was between 20 and 25 percent of GDP at the early 1980s. No, it's still at the same level in Germany, but in France it's less than 10 percent now. So we lost all the productive capacity because of this free movement of capital. And in exchange, we were, I mean, the leaders of the time were considering what they needed to uh, to anchor themselves with the Dutch mark and create a common currency. And they, Germany was not very willing to do. And the French continued to give uh, up whatever they could to please Germany. So this is how we uh, went to the Madrid and Maastricht uh, treaties, which were basically uh, dictated by Germany as a, a condition to give up on, uh, to give their own currency to everyone, in which they uh, basically uh, tried to uh, enforce this uh, order liberal thinking of uh, prohibiting to the central bank to uh, contribute to the uh, public finances by uh, prohibiting to the central bank to help the state by uh, so-called monetary finance, financing, which is to buy the uh, uh, bonds issued by the um, government. Um, 
So from this point, basically, and we had this proof about the 3% uh, uh, deficit should not be uh, over 3% of GDP, etc. But the main uh, problem was this uh, prohibition, I would say, of monetization of the debt. So starting this point, the debt in all countries started to, uh, to raise because there was no, no mean to basically make it uh, disappear uh, uh, in the accounts of the central bank. And, um, and the rules were made like the French and, uh, and other countries were considering, okay, we give the rules to the Germans, but anyway, we will not respect the rules. So, uh, and Germany itself uh, was engaged into a kind of like a uh, non-cooperative uh, internal uh, competitive disinflation at the beginning of the euro. So we, uh, we first absorbed uh, East Germany uh, with very low levels of salaries. Uh, they then like expanded their production base to be uh, in, uh, in the later years to be uh, like new member states, so-called in the uh, central eastern uh, uh, part of the European Union. Uh, and they did the so-called hearts reform, basically which alone like to keep very uh, low salaries uh, in the German industry while having a uh, fixed uh, exchange rate with other countries. So they started to, uh, well, in other countries, basically the cost of production were higher. And the, in addition, the inflation was higher as well, but you had uh, the same policy rates from the central bank for all countries. So some countries were kind of overheating, while the rates were uh, OK for Germany. And uh, Germany having a lower cost of production, they were basically having a competitive advantage for the exports. Which was, and then their like surplus, external surplus was increasing by the day, I would say. And in a normal situation, when you have like currency flexibility between countries, you have like uh, if one country has a surplus to what's over, then basically the currency adjusts to compensate. So this like price competitiveness is erased by the, by the like adjustment of the exchange rate. But in a, in a fixed U chain exchange rate like Eurozone, it's not possible. So basically, there is nothing which uh, counterbalances the price competitiveness of Germany, which is always increasing. So it's a massive drag on other countries uh, of the Eurozone. Uh, and this is not going in the pockets of the German workers, who has very low salaries and who are kind of relatively poor. It goes in the pockets of the uh, little UPS class of the uh, exporting companies of Germany and in the pockets of the shareholders of the German exporting companies, especially cars, etc., which uh, are not even uh, Europeans. Uh, they are, uh, at least half of them are from the US. Uh, so basically, you have a drag of wealth coming out from the uh, European Union through Germany, not even in the pockets of the German workers due to the, uh, to the Eurozone. So anyway, long story to make it short, Euro is kind of like costing a lot of money for country, I mean, costing a lot of wealth for like citizens of uh, France and Italy, uh, not even profiting uh, German citizens. and. Uh, and the system right now is uh, ready to uh, implode because uh, the crisis additionally is uh, the current crisis is striking much more uh, countries with uh, like uh, weaker I would say fiscal and debt situation uh, like Italy, Spain, and France uh, than uh, than Germany. Uh, situation is actually especially dif difficult for France because, uh, as I often say, in, uh, Italy. Uh, Basically, when you have a huge lot of debt, you have three solutions. Uh, there's not many. You can escape it by uh, default. You can escape it uh, by, uh, I mean, default and restructuration of the debt. Uh, you can ex escape it uh, by austerity. And you can escape it by uh, monetization. So to come back on this, like default, it's uh, like, let's say, what uh, did Greece. In the past years, uh, you explained to the creditors that uh, they own like 100 uh, euro of debt, but actually it was only like 70%. Uh, and this is not possible for countries like France and Italy because uh, countries are too big, the debt is too big, and uh, the debt of, uh, of these countries is uh, held in uh, many, uh, by many asset managers and by many banks, uh, including uh, global systemically uh, important financial institutions. If uh, one of these banks, uh, if like you have a haircut on the French or Italian debt of 20%, these banks got bankrupt. And you have a major global financial crisis uh, on top of the current uh, economic crisis. So default is not possible for these countries. Austerity is not possible as well. Like uh, Italy is actually in permanent austerity since uh, entering the, uh, since 1992. Uh, uh, 
uh, if you take uh, like in the past 25 years, uh, Italy each year was having a primary surplus, which means that they were earning more tax revenue than spending. Uh, they were having on average a primary surplus close to 2% of GDP. Uh, there was only one year uh, where they had, uh, they did not have a primary surplus was in 2009. So just after the global financial crisis. So we, actually Italy has a, is enforcing austerity, harsh austerity already since uh, 25 years. Uh, but French cannot. French, uh, they never had, I mean, I think they had one or twice a primary surplus. Uh, so we do not know how to uh, enforce austerity, and it's good for uh, it's good for the French economy. But the Italian economy cannot do more than they were doing already. So austerity uh, is not a solution because it's uh, self-defeating. Uh, basically, uh, when you have the state which is like uh, uh, taxing more than spending, you have, I would say, a kind of negative multiplier effect. The state needs to inject economy inject money into the economy in order for this economy to turn and create uh, more wealth itself, which uh, creates more uh, tax revenue and which kind of self-finance additional spending of the state. If you do the reverse, you have the, you have the reverse effect. Like for instance, in Greece, the creditors imposed the past, uh, in the current program, like uh, every year, Greece uh, must have a 3.5 uh, primary surplus, 3.5% of GDP primary surplus, and this is dramatic. Like you would have a primary surplus of 2%, for instance. This 1.5% additional spending in the economy by the state, so less taxation or more spending, whatever, uh, will have a multiplier effect of 3. So you have this uh, uh, 1.5 spending more in the economy, like uh, having a primary surplus only of 2% instead of 3.5, will generate something close to 4.5% of uh, additional GDP for Greece, which will generate itself something like 2.25% of GDP additional tax receipts. Mm. So basically, you have a self-financing, I would say, uh, of the additional spending. So austerity is defeating because it basically kills the uh, growth. And basically, when you don't have a growth, growth, um, basically the GDP is... Uh, denominator of the ratio debt on GDP. So you have like a, you have the debt which continues to grow in terms of ratio debt on GDP. That's what's happening basically to the European Union, to the Eurozone since 1992, since the uh, Maastricht uh, Treaty and the uh, uh, internal market uh, being enforced. So the only situation, uh, only solution we have is the third one, which is uh, monetization, which is uh, what central banks are doing right now worldwide, which is basically uh, these uh, asset uh, purchasing programs, uh, uh, massive uh, asset purchasing programs like uh, the uh, Bank of Japan is holding uh, more than half of, uh, of Japanese debt right now. Any, any new uh, debt which is issued by the US government is bought by the Federal Reserve. You have additional, uh, you have like uh, several hundreds, I think it's uh, currently something like 400 billion of bonds uh, program for uh, for the UK, and you have the programs of the ECB. So I start to answer your question <laughs> after this long detour about the uh, European Central Banks. So basically, because of this prohibition of uh, monetary financing by the Mast Maastricht Treaty, uh, actually the ECB started very late to do asset purchasing, while other countries were doing massively, massively after the 2008 financial crisis. ECB started to do it really only in 2015. And uh, basically that was a little bit this misunderstanding of the Maastricht Treaty, as I said, like Germans were putting the rules in the treaty and others were accepting because they were, they were like, happy to do this trick. Okay, we got the uh, common currency, but in, this, in any case we will trample the rules, not respect them, and nobody will see. And actually in 2015, with the starting of the quantitative easing by uh, Mario Draghi, uh, they used the pretext of the mandate of the European Central Bank, which is stability of prices. They said we are close to defla deflation. We need to do something to reflate the economy. So we will create, generate a little bit of inflation by massively buying assets, including, well, buying uh, treasury bonds. I mean, uh, buying bonds from uh, issued uh, debt issued by the, by the states. Of course, it was absolutely needed to do this uh, monetization uh, for Italian and French debt already in 2015. 
uh, it was uh, basically accepted very reluctant, reluctantly by Germany, of course, they tried to block it until the last extent. There was a kind of deal which, uh, which was uh, done, despite so-called independence uh, of central banks, there was a kind of uh, deal that uh, Germany will let it go for the uh, quantitative easing in 2015 uh, in exchange of the full support of the ECB for, to squeeze politically Greece. Uh, we could uh, expand on that, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, basically uh, all this was done to support states and had, I would say, it has something to do with uh, price stability, but it was doing uh, monetization. One thing is that when you do monetization, it's not like only buying the debt. You have to keep it. Because if you, if the central bank buys uh, Italian debt or French debt and then sell it a few years later, well, it do not help. You have to keep the debt until it uh, arrives to maturity. And uh, I mean, until it, uh, like for a 10 years debt, if you buy it, it was already three years old, you keep it for the remaining seven years. And then you reinvest the proceeds buying new debt in order to keep, to keep the level of uh, debt of this country, uh, which you hold, uh, constant. Uh uh, and uh, basically, even before this crisis, uh, at the end of 2019, with the program and uh, its continuation and its reactivation, November last year, by the ECB, you had basically 25% of uh, French and Italian debt, which was held by the, uh, let's call it ECB, but actually it's more the European system of central banks, because uh, there is a rule that uh, each central, national central bank is buying 80% uh, of its amounts of the, its own debt and 20% by the ECB itself. So, for instance, when you have you had at the beginning of the year 25% of Italian debt and French debt, which was uh, held, as we say, by the ECB, it was actually money money which was created by Banque de France and uh, Banca d'Italia for 80% of it and 20% by the ECB itself. So you have basically. On 25%, uh, 80% of it should be something, what, like 17%? So at the beginning of the year, you had 17% of the Italian debt, which was uh, held by Banca d'Italia, after creation of money by Banca d'Italia. So basically, this debt de facto do not exist anymore, and unless it will be sold back on the market. If you don't sell it back, and reinvest, reinvest the proceeds, but monetization. You basically make the debt disappear forever. And with the financial, this, this current crisis, not the financial crisis, but this uh, COVID crisis, well, with the uh, new programs uh, of the ECB, uh, so the old program was called the PSPP, and the new program is called the PEPP, but basically that's the same idea, just that uh, you have uh, basically uh, from a program which was something like 2002, 2,500 billion, uh, you have a new program, which is uh, 1,350 uh, uh, billion uh, euros. Uh, you uh, continue to, ECB continue to buy the debt, and there are actually like uh, trampling limits, which were put in place by the uh, European Court of Justice and by the uh, German Constitutional Courts in terms of uh, like several limits, like if there is, uh, the two main limits, it's three criteria, actually, which uh, Germans consider should not be uh, trampled in order not to have monetization. The first one is that, and these criteria were basically put in paper by the German Constitutional Court. So they said, if uh, central bank, European Central Bank, do not go over these limits, then it will not be monetization. So we can accept it. And these rules were kind of like accept, accepted by the European Court of Justice. And the three men, I would say, I mean, actually there is a, a few of them, like uh, it should be bought, the debt should be bought on the secondary market and not directly. Uh, so it's not direct monetary financing. Uh, it should be bought after some time, so on the secondary market, so not right away. <laughs> and there is uh, like three rules. The most important is the one I mentioned already, that uh, securities, I mean the debt, should not be kept by the central bank until its maturity. So it, it should be so, sold back before it, uh, it arrives to maturity. And of course, so far, all the debt which was bought I ha had been kept until maturity. So it was monetization. Second thing, there is a so-called capital key limit, which is that uh, it was decided when the quantitative easing was launched that uh, uh, actually all securities were bought, like it was not a plan to support Italy and France, it was uh, 
like all if it was supposed to help price stability i mean to raise level of inflation so it should apply equally according to the size of each member state so basically uh, the european system of central banks is buying mainly uh, german bond uh, because uh, of the capital key of germany we, i forget the exact number but something like around 22 percent so basically the bundesbank was uh, in this program of uh, 2500 billion euros uh, Bundesbank was uh, paying 80 percent of uh, of 22 uh, percent of the total. I don't know if I'm clear, but basically, and uh, like a capital key for uh, it's a, like shareholdership of the national central banks, European central banks. So Germany is the main shareholder and France and Italy, and so the purchasing of debt was uh, done by each central bank buying its own debt in proportion for the total envelope of ECB in proportion of the respective size of each economy within the Eurozone. And uh, right now we are in a situation, it was kind of working, uh, and, oh sorry, and there is a last, uh, last uh, criteria I would say I want to mention is the so-called 33%, 33% of, uh, of uh, debt of each country a limit that the uh, European system of central banks should not go over holding more than one third of the debt of each country. It's a little bit more complicated than this, but uh, in a summary, like it should be 33% of each line of each rent, actually. But I made a mistake, by the way. Uh, I said 25% at the beginning of the year, sorry. It was 25% held by the national central bank, but the, actually the total uh, purchasing of the European system of central bank close to 33% or 33% was a share which was held by Banca d'Italia of Italian debt and by Banque de France for uh, French uh, debt. So actually, at the beginning of this year, the limit of 33% was already uh, reached. Why this limit exists? Because basically, uh, there is rules in issuance of debt uh, in Eurozone since 2013, but uh, in case of restructuration of debt, so uh, in case there would be like a default, uh, there is like uh, bondholders meetings and they decide uh, to restructure or not, to have a haircut or not. And there is a threshold for the decision that a blocking minority is reached as 33%. So basically, if the central bank hold more than 33%, they are the ones actually decided, deciding if they want to do uh, the haircut or not. So basically, the central bank is in a position to accept to do monetary fi financing or not. If they accept to do monetary financing, they are infringing the treaties. If they refuse to do the monetary financing, uh, they refuse the restructuration. So because of them, you have like a chaotic situation of uh, disorderly default. So this is why you have this 33% limit. Uh, and right now, with the new program, the capital keys uh, is not respected. The 33% limit is uh, not respected as well. At the end of the year, we will have the European system of central bank, which, is, which will hold 40%, 40 percent, 40 of uh, Italian and French debt. And of course, they have no intent to sell it back on the market. So basically, on May 5th, it was the uh, <coughs> like, uh, end of a process which uh, lasted, which lasted, I think, uh, something like three years. Uh, there was a back and forth between the German Constitutional Court and the ECG. German Constitutional Court constituted, decided and in 2000, uh, 2018, I forgot the exact date, but uh, they decided that uh, what they decided again on May 5th, they said that basically this program is not appropriate. And the European Court of Justice said, no, the program uh, works fine. And then he, the Constitutional Court in Germany decided to take back the case because they considered that uh, it was not properly assessed by the uh, European Court of Justice. And they, they said, look, again, it was a, a case which was uh, touching upon the former quantitative easing. I mean, the, it still exists, but it's not the current pandemic uh, program. So they were saying, look, it's not monetary, monetary financing if you continue to follow the five rules I mentioned, which was the case for the earlier program. But of course, it's not the case for the new one. But the judgment is about the former one. And first thing, so they said, okay, so far it's not monetary financing. But in deciding in deciding this uh, program, the European Central Bank 
basically twisted totally the uh, spirit of the treaty. I mean, uh, they uh, are actually supporting the states, pretending to uh, want to raise uh, level of inflation and to respect price stability. So basically, uh, the uh, German constitutional court is uh, kind of like uh, taking out the veil of the, uh, like this attempt to uh, do something uh, uh, prohibited, which uh, Draghi put in place and the ECB put in place in 2015, pretending about price stability, but actually wanting to help the state. And like nobody says anything, it seems obvious to everybody, but the German constitutional court said, okay, it's enough now. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you are like, uh, like uh, it has an impact. It's not decided democratically. Like uh, it's not in the treaties, so it was not uh, ratified by uh, democratically by the parliament or by a referendum. Uh, you decided to do it, but nobody gave you this mandate. It do not, uh, uh, it do not follow your mandate. So you are totally, uh, you are totally uh, beyond the limit. And they said, look, we don't believe this. Uh, what you are doing is uh, according to the treaty. So we use this. Uh, vocable of proportionality because uh, basically uh, in German uh, law system uh, when you take uh, any decision you have to prove that it is uh, proportionate to the objective. So they explain okay you pretend it will have an impact of inflation but actually it has much major impact on the economy and on the uh, solvability of individual states. So uh, you have to prove that actually you did this decision specifically for price stability and not for any other consideration. And they asked, they gave three months, basically, they asked the German government and the German Bundestag uh, parliament to uh, organize that they got the elements proving uh, that uh, this decision of the quantitative easing was indeed for price stability and not something else. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and basically, everyone knows that this proportionality cannot be demonstrated uh, because uh, because uh, of course uh, it has an impact of inflation, but uh, but it has much more over impact, including uh, helping states uh, to uh, make their debt sustainable. Which I think again it's a necessary thing. Yeah. But they uh, we have uh, they have two aspects in there. We have to kind of like uh, clear this. Uh, it's not a misunderstanding. It's like this uh, pretension between countries that they share a common view on monetary policy and economic policy, why actually they have totally diverging views. So we need to make clear who wants what. Germans do not want to do monetization. French and Italians absolutely need monetization. And, um, and the second thing is, uh, is that um, we have to uh, actually uh, clarify, I would say, the processes. Uh, I mean, we have to put more democratic decision into these uh, technocratic decisions of the central banks. And we have to revisit the so-called independence of central banks. I said earlier that the actions of central banks currently in the global financial, in the global economic crisis was needed and legitimate, but at the same time, as we described as well, it creates a bubble in financial market and do not reach the, uh, and kind of aggravate the inequalities within the population. So. We have to have uh, like more co democratic control of the uh, decisions of the uh, central banks in general, and the European central banks in particular. So what I think we are heading for, and I will, uh, well, it's a little bit long on this uh, explanation, but uh, and I hope it was understandable. But uh, I think right now we, like Germany, and I mean German politicians and the German citizens, uh, they always hated these uh, ECB policies at the time of Mario Draghi. And uh, I think they cannot stand it anymore. So either the ECB becomes a German Bundesbank piece, like it was intended in 1992, it's a treaty, or they just leave the joint monetary policy. Yeah. But this time, I would say, contrary to, uh, contrary to 1992 and the following uh, decades, Right now, with the level of debt which we will reach in France, it would be something like 120, 125 percent of GDP. In Italy, it would be something like 170 percent of GDP of debt. If we don't have the monetization by the central bank, it's not possible. As I said, we cannot have default, we cannot have uh, austerity. So we, these countries really need monetization. So they like basically ECB 
sided, I would say, with its current practice, because we know it's not, it would just create like a major, major crisis worldwide if France or Italy default. And basically, Germany has no other choice than actually to leave the joint monetary policy. Mm -hmm. So what will happen, uh, I think, and we can, uh, we can perhaps uh, make a rendezvous <laughs> after August 5th, because uh, the court of Castro uh, gave three months to have this demonstration of proportionality. Mm -hmm. And this demonstration will not happen, because it's not possible. And uh, so yesterday, the ECB gave uh, 50 kilograms, uh, as we say, of documents to be given to the Bundestag via the Bundesbank, but these documents are like past uh, decisions, uh, minutes, and these decisions, like the head of the German Bundesbank was uh, participating to them and strongly opposed the plan as not being proportionate to the inflation objective, but helping states to uh, finance their deficits. So, like, there is nothing to demonstrate, and basically the Bundesbank on May 5th, we just apply the sentence on uh, August 5th, we just, uh, so the delay of three months, we'll apply the sentence of uh, May 5th and we'll stop participating to the quantitative easing. So it will be like the first step for Germany to uh, exclude itself from the uh, ECB monetary policy. And of course it will, uh, it will not, it cannot, start, it cannot stop there. I mean, it's just a starting point, because as soon as you uh, start uh, buying boons uh, and you actually organize to sell boons, then there will be like a, a major like a divergency in terms of uh, evolution uh, of the bond uh, debt acquisition between uh, Germany and the rest of the Eurozone. And it will basically trigger at some point that Germany will have to uh, stop capital inflows to Germany, to stop to uh, aggravate the target to bal imbalances and uh, capital controls, etc. So we will, at the end, arrive to a point where Germany will exceed the Eurozone. And I think we will actually exceed, not alone, but we will exceed with uh, countries like Netherlands, Finland, the Baltics, etc. So we'll have like a nice uh, cut, uh, clear, split between uh, two Eurozones, I think, uh, the uh, uh, sovereign countries, including France and the northern countries. So let's have this rendezvous after August 5th to uh, discuss what happened, but uh, I make the bet that, uh, that Germany, uh, a very sure bet actually, that Germany on August 5th at the latest will uh, exit quantitative easing. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sebastian for the very detailed and very informative uh, analysis. And I can see from the chat, uh, some of the participants appreciated it quite a lot. I know you made yourself uh, free from another commitment when it is now 1, 1 p.m. in the UK. So I wonder whether it, it would be fine for you to stay just 10, 15 minutes more with us, because I can see a few the participants. The, the first one is, uh, I see a line from uh, Shilizi Monet. Uh, would you like to talk? Uh, uh, through audio, if uh, they have uh, a microphone, and therefore there are in the chat uh, some questions from uh, Mahmoud and uh, Jacob at the moment. So if that's fine, uh, I would invite uh, on the spot uh, Silizi first, uh, if they can speak through the microphone. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Um, I think it was very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm a member of Parliament of the Republic of South Africa. I'm also the WIP on Health Portfolio Committee, meaning therefore I give political direction in Parliament on health matters with respect to combating or fighting the battle against COVID-19. In my committee, all the ministers must be there and understand their party political position. Uh, so therefore, this, this is very interesting presentation that's relevant to South Africa. Our country has been downgraded by the rating agencies. Our debt to GDP is almost 82% as of um, this month. And I think uh, we already resolved uh, to borrow money from the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, already we have received some, uh, there's a commitment to receive funding from the uh, BRICS Development Bank. So what we, in my analysis, this is my view, I think 
the external applications of the austerity measures, which in your presentation you said it doesn't work. I 100% agree with you yes, that. Exactly. The, uh, which which measures? Austerity, austerity measures. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That you said it's not, it's not, it doesn't work. And mm. I, I can I agree with you 100% that the um, the COVID-19 has brought some unintended or devastating impact uh, that really we have not seen for the past 200 years. So it impacted in the economy and also collapsed the health system or overwhelmed the health systems. So in the context of globalization, as you know, globalization don't only move goods and services. I mean, logistics, we also move logistics and so on. But people move with the planes, right? And that spread the pandemic. And I agree with you, one of the negative examples is that the Virgin, Virgin Airline in Australia has been liquidated. But I'm trying to give side some of the examples that relate to uh, the, some of the impact. So I would want to understand, um, in our own situation, I would want to understand that the in Britain, initial UK or Britain, when they decided to or vote to leave the European Union, was that based on the disagreement on the common uh, monetary policies disagreement, or, or possibly is it anti-globalization? What could be the basis in your own personal view? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very honored uh, that you are uh, listening to, uh, to this broadcast and uh, thank you for your very comprehensive question. So on the first aspect about uh, basically the public finances and debt sustainability, you know, like uh, uh, I'm speaking under your control, but I think like the latest IMF uh, forecast for South Africa for this year will be 8% uh, uh, minus 8% uh, decrease of the GDP which is something uh, like uh, huge and uh, we are in a situation where i think how to say like we have basically to put everything into the fight all like public finance we can I'm not thinking about the debt because we have basically to fight this economic situation right now uh, with all the means hoping that uh, at a later stage next year or the year after extra growth will help with the debt and uh, debt sustainability. But if we do not fight right now, basically this uh, situation where we have 8, 10, 12% of GDP recession will like put the whole society into uh, total chaos. We need to keep people employed. We need to support companies to stay open, especially SMEs. We need to uh, uh, keep the health system working. So we have to basically spend without thinking, I think, for all like the global community. And, uh, especially uh, uh, like countries are as important as uh, South Africa. Uh, that's, uh, that's for the first aspect. We need to basically, it's, uh, if we need to be still alive next year in order to be able to consider about the debt. Uh, if we are dead economically, socially, uh, etc., it's, uh, it's no use. Uh, so basically all the forces need to be put in the battle right now. For UK, as you know, basically at the beginning, UK was uh, in the 1990s, uh, I mean, until 1992, UK was uh, in the monetary system, and, uh, was planned to participate to the uh, Eurozone. And then uh, it went out after the 1992 uh, like speculative crisis, and uh, then the UK uh, uh, decided uh, again, uh, will they participate or not, and they decided not to participate to the Eurozone. And I think uh, for the UK, it was a very positive decision uh, in the, at this time not to participate. And they had basically all the advantages of the euro without having the macroeconomic in inconvenience to be part of it. Basically, London with the uh, harmonization of, uh, of the uh, financial uh, laws uh, and regulation and uh, banking and financial services uh, uh, laws in the European Union, it was uh, before the end of the 90s, it was needed to like be multi-local, multi-domestic, to have like recreate the whole uh, uh, for financial services to install in each member state of the European Union to provide services. But after 
in, in, starting in 1999-2000, basically you could do everything from one country, so all the financial industry like concentrated in London, provided the financial services for the whole continent, for the whole EU, from uh, one place. And basically the whole liquidity, financial liquidity of the Eurozone moved away, like all the liquidity in uh, financial markets, bond markets, uh, etc., moved to London. And London became like uh, the financial place for the whole Euro Eurozone without being inside the Eurozone. So they didn't have the constraints in terms of macroeconomy, but they had all the advantages of the liquidity of, uh, and the debt of the uh, Euro-denominated financial markets. So that was uh, one aspect. And the, uh, so we could have, like in the mind of like, I would say mainstream uh, politicians like David Cameron, they thought it's a very good situation. And we have to basically uh, continue in this kind of free riding, being different, but taking advantage of the uh, harmonization of the EU, not having been obliged to uh, like enforce it fully, but, uh, but uh, taking uh, advantages. And uh, the city of London was, of course, very happy of the situation. But what happened is that, uh, as you know, within the opening, you have the, uh, not only the free circulation of capital and goods and services, but of people as well. And as soon as new member states join, I mean, probably many of you are living in London, so I'm kind of like uh, preaching people who know better the situation than me, but uh, like there was a huge influx of uh, workers from the uh, new member states in, uh, in uh, UK, and uh, this like put pressure on, uh, on the salaries down and uh, put competition on, uh, on the workers uh, from like, uh, uh, UK has France had a very difficult uh, situation with disindustrialization. So you had this influx of uh, of uh, qualified people coming from Eastern member states, but uh, accepting uh, low pay jobs and uh, low qualification jobs, etc. So basically, the the base, I would say, the uh, like uh, population which is not uh, working in the city of London uh, was very unhappy with uh, the European Union. So they kind of like uh, voted to leave. And uh, actually, UK had the chance to. Uh, sorry if I heard some political feelings of you. I see it from outside, so it's not. I'm not involved in British politics, but I have to say that you had the chance to have uh, someone who has a clear view in the current situation to maximize the positive potential positive effects of uh, of Brexit with uh, Boris Johnson. Because uh, since you're leaving. So it can be discutable what is the best economic interest uh, should the uh, UK be inside the EU or, or outside. No, there is no chance that it is inside, so it's outside. So let's just plunge and have policies which maximize the potential uh, beneficial effect for uh, UK to be outside. Meaning having protectionist policies, uh, trying to reconstitute a domestic uh, internal market, trying to give jobs to people, trying to reinitialize to re re reshore and relocalize the production uh, and uh, basically uh, having a policy of, uh, of support to the internal demand. And actually, you know, like the uh, European Union, it's uh, this uh, free circulation of everything, capital, goods, etc. So basically you, you have this so-called huge internal market, which is itself totally open to the outside world, like uh, there is actually no protectionism at, of any kind to try to protect the internal European market. Not only like the uh, like barriers uh, are uh, erased between member states, but it's erased with the rest of the world. So it's like a stepic uh, flat uh, uh, area which is uh, penetrable by everyone. And so um, UK being out, um, I mean, this, this issue of like uh, recreating like nurturing a domestic market, focusing on the internal demand, you know, countries like uh, UK, France, Italy, Germany, etc. This is like 60, 70, 80 million people markets of wealthy people. And it could be, I would not say self-sufficient, but if there would be like a, like a focus on giving jobs to people within the country, like recreating industries, etc. People have a, like status in society, they have a job, they have revenue, they spend, Etc. You, you have like a, a machine which is put in place and which star, starts basically to create growth by itself. And that's actually what uh, Boris Johnson is attempting to do. And uh, honestly, I commend uh, his efforts and I think uh, he's the right person at the right moment. And I hope he will be able to continue what he wants to do. Well, thank you both uh, for, the, for the exchange.
Uh, Sebastian, I hope that's fine if we quickly at least to take a few questions which were left Absolutely. there in the chat. So, uh, Wait, right. Right. Saudi Arabia Friday is a holiday, is a, is a weekend, you know, it's like yeah. Sunday. So I have all time you want. So I, I, feel, I feel a bit more guilty to take time from your space time in this case, however. So we have a few questions from Mahmoud here on the chat. The first one uh, comes into two parts, as you can see, probably. So he mentions there is the Federal Reserve rate, which has been fixed under a quarterly point for at least 2022, a very low interest rate environment in the US. Many do perceive that we're probably looking at a depression rather than a recession there in the US. What do you think? How do you see economics prospects there? So, but uh, one aspect, uh, thank you, uh, Mahmoud, to uh, mention that because I, I didn't mention actually that uh, in terms of debt sustainability, in addition, we are in a situation where market rates in many countries, uh, especially in the Eurozone, are negative. So basically, like uh, states receive money for borrowing, like the people borrow 100 for them, and, uh, and basically uh, they like pay the states for borrowing from the state, uh, for like lending to the state, sorry. So negative interest rates on the public debt. So in this context of uh, very low uh, market rates, it's uh, I would say criminal not to actually. It will be criminal not to seize the occasion to massively uh, inject uh, like uh, money in the economy through uh, public uh, indebtedness. So regarding the U.S. and um, like uh, the shape of the recovery. Uh, are we in a recession, depression? It's uh, honestly difficult to do, to, to assess. As I said at the beginning, we are in like major uncertainty, uh, uh, situation of major uncertainty. This said, like I would say that the consensus forecast, including IMF, OECD, et cetera, seem to indicate that the, uh, the debt of the recession this year will be uh, less profound in the US than in the Eurozone, for instance. Uh, and, uh, and that the, I would say, flexibility of the US economy will allow uh, like a faster recovery. That's what is uh, currently uh, uh, foreseen. This said, what I described about the uh, like big company being kind of <clears throat> more easily supported versus small medium enterprises having more difficulties to be reached by the uh, state support, I mean, by the federal state in this case uh, support, and, uh, and basically having all these investments made by the owners of the SMEs, uh, the companies being wiped off by the uh, crisis. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like a lost generation uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, like uh, corporate investments uh, for the small enterprises, I mean, including in the US. So it's, uh, I think, still that U.S. will recover more easily than uh, than Eurozone. Uh, there are more flexibility, and uh, and uh, I would say uh, that uh, the programs designed by the uh, U.S. federal government and the Congress, I think, were more efficient in reaching the uh, small. Uh, like the individuals and small companies than in Europe. So I think all in all, US has more chances to get out in a be better shape than most uh, Eurozone countries. And within the Eurozone, Germany will recover more easily than France, Italy, and Spain, for instance. So we have uh, this kind of diverging trajectories, which are definitely a concern. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Sebastian. There is a second question, again, from uh, uh, Mahmoud, Mahmoud uh, which it seems to be direct towards me, actually. So, so taxation is an issue, and many governments have adopted elements of austerity, which will help in reducing the public debt, but will depress growth to some degree. The core measure should be addressed towards the public spending sources that will support the economy in the long run and help grow. What would be the view of uh, Alberto on how spending should be addressed or directed? Uh, well, I can share some ideas, and Sebastian, if you wanted to expand on it. Uh, Sebastian earlier mentioned the, the multiplier effect of public spending, uh, which I fully agree. I was, uh, had in mind the idea that there can be many multipliers, actually, to public sector spending, uh, depending on what we spend the public, public money on. So it's like, uh, on, at one extreme, the government can just act like uh, an employer of the resort. 
and to pay people for doing the jobs which may not really add too much to public services in a sense. And so this uh, also relates probably to a issue with the low productivity of public sector in many countries at least. On the other extreme, uh, probably it makes sense to think about other forms of spending uh, which can be more impactful from infrastructure to general technical soft skills uh, of people. I do not want to praise any particular population, so I believe it can be anything from computer scientists to geneticists to better social workers and so on. But if, uh, if uh, we are asked, uh, probably just because of my profession, I'm especially big on education, and especially starting from uh, kids, from schools. These are, uh, if we accept a multiplier effect, uh, if we are patient enough to accept a multiplier to, to display the effect, the impact, uh, not to in a short term, but we are patient enough, uh, probably it would be especially big on uh, investing on uh, schools, our kids, uh, our skills uh, for next generation to come in a sense. To be my, my line on answer, I don't know whether Sebastian, you have any, anything added to add, anything more to add concerning where uh, could governments spend money on if they diverge from austerity measures. Very, very briefly, uh, two aspects. One I mentioned already, which is that there is a big hole in uh, taxation, which is the uh, digital economy. Uh, I mean, especially the uh, US uh, international or the digital economy who do not pay taxes anywhere. This is a major problem. Uh, I think there should be like a, a convergency, uh, I would say, like the uh, like criteria to uh, the criteria to tax these companies uh, should be where the consumer is. And it should be like a little bit, not a VAT, but uh, like uh, this multinational US uh, digital company should pay taxes where their consumers are. Uh, we, should, uh, we should go towards this and it is uh, of major macroeconomic impact. I think uh, the loss in terms of tax revenues of this uh, US multinational companies for France is uh, of the order like of 2% of GDP each year of uh, loss of tax revenue. As you know, it is a program, uh, the so-called BEPS, uh, Bas Erosion and Profit Shifting Program of the OECD, and, uh, and recently the US kind of like decided to put an hold on this. Uh, they don't want their companies to be taxed in other countries. These companies do not pay taxes to them either, but they still hope that at one point they will be able to find a trick uh, to uh, make them pay more than they pay right now. Uh, okay. I don't know if... Uh, if I'm clear, but this is in terms of, uh, and since the digital economy is one of the sectors which profits actually, even profits for the current crisis, it accelerates actually the digitalization of the uh, global economy, and uh, the major players are not paying taxes. It is uh, honestly like uh, corporate taxes. It's a major issue for all of us, and uh, this should be definitely addressed as a priority because uh, before uh, thinking where to spend efficiently, we need to uh, to have the revenue. Uh, and it's, uh, if uh, these companies do not pay, all the burden, fiscal burden, will be on citizens uh, who cannot move countries and will be on small medium enterprises. And, uh, and this is not acceptable socially. Uh, it uh, accelerates this concentration of wealth in a few hands and impoverishing the middle class uh, everywhere. In terms of priority of spending, I think uh, the states will need to. Uh, Kind of uh, accompany the uh, transition uh, because of this crisis you will have sectors which will be uh, irremediably damaged most probably and uh, and this uh, again like uh, currently it's uh, transportation uh, entertainment uh, tourism and uh, need to accompany i would say the reskilling of uh, of people towards the most uh, like buoyant sectors uh, uh, to allow them to kind of like I would say adapt their qualification to be able to uh, find a, a role in the economy post, uh, post crisis. Well, thank you, Sebastian. Also, because I believe uh, you also already addressed the third question uh, from, uh, uh, from Amoud concerning precisely BEPS. Uh, well, probably just uh, one more modest addition from my side. There should be a role uh, around the talking, not just the behavior of multinational companies, of course, that they do the best they can to, the, to, re to reduce the tax bill but probably uh, what governments can do to increase uh, their coordination uh, to agree on uh, tax policies uh, without eroding each other's tax base, of course, including the role of uh, tax havens uh, to some extent, uh, insofar they, they facilitate some legal arrangements uh, to, 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 to diverge uh, revenue and profits uh, somewhere else. 
Mm -hmm. If that's fine, we can move on to questions from. Oh, do you want to add anything? Just very briefly, I mean, the whole problem is that uh, the current system is. Uh, I describe a little bit like a pre-1990 situation where states were trying to make their citizens happy and post-1990 we are in a world where the only criteria is the shareholders maximization of, uh, of profit and like uh, you said it's, it seems to us very natural that uh, multinational companies try to minimize their tax bill but it is absolutely not fair I mean and we find it normal I would say because legally the only things which counts is that the shareholders are happy, and uh, the more share—I mean, the more people are like squeezed professionally and uh, like uh, laid off, and uh, production is delocalized and costs are reduced. Shareholders are more happy, and uh, but like the ma majority of the population of the stakeholders, I would say, are unhappy. So I think really that's uh, currently like a major, uh, major issue. Uh, Actually, I said it would be brief, but I make a second parenthesis. Uh, uh, like, if you observe the difference between, uh, like, Africa, for instance, in terms of uh, COVID propagation and, uh, and Europe, you see that actually there is much more rate of uh, of death uh, of COVID in uh, rich countries compared to poor countries. Why? Because uh, I will enter into this polemic about the like medication, but uh, it was observed in China in January, February, I mean, December, January, actually, that uh, there was a combination of hydroxychloroquine and acetromycin, which was working to basically stop the propagation of the virus. Basically, when it is protected, not only they are recovered more easily, but they stop being contagious. And these drugs basically exist, uh, especially hydroxychloroquine, exists since eight years. It was taken by two billion people, and it is it's anti-malarial drug, so everyone has it in Africa. They know it perfectly, they use it a lot. Before COVID crisis, so they, gave it, they gave it very easily, and basically it stopped propagation of the virus. Why in Europe, we are under this uh, economic logic of finding at all cost a new vaccine or a new drug, because it should be a new product, because all products do not bring any money, because anyone can produce them. So you need like some, maximization of profit of one company and its shareholders to uh, find the new drug and uh, because of this model like they refused basically there was a lot of lobbying and uh, propaganda and uh, you know like Lancet study and things like this and OMS uh, WHO I mean uh, and basically the rich countries were actually refusing to use the cheap available drug under any pretext and this is uh, why we have uh, like maximization of number of uh, death in uh, European countries, for instance. And that's, uh, I would say, like uh, another example of how the uh, maximization of the shareholder uh, profit is uh, creating a havoc to society and economy. Yeah. Thank you also for this thoughts, uh, Sebastian. I hope that's fine. I take just one last question out of the chat, uh, especially because it does relate with a lot of interest of our students at SOAS and settings in particular uh, who work or are based in developing countries. And so Jacob asked, uh, thank you very much for your analysis first uh, to help understand uh, the prospects for recovery for develop and developing economy. And uh, the question from, from Jacob is actually in a developing economy context, uh, what do you think are the perspectives there? What to, would you recommend to a developing country uh, in, to do internally and they write uh, so that we do not end up running for to IMF for bonds, grants uh, and so on. So I, I believe the spirit of the question is uh, can you see anything domestically in terms of domestic policy for a developing country and uh, what they, they can do to, to take uh, with the effect of the pandemic in the next years? Well, uh, <clears throat> I personally believe uh, it depends on, uh, on the size of the population, uh, mostly like uh, big I mean, for like developing uh, emerging markets, uh, countries uh, with uh, important population, there is definitely a path to develop the uh, internal demand and having uh, like a cycle of development which will be internal. The idea that uh, countries uh, must uh, at all costs insert themselves into the globalization chains is, uh, I would say, is a little bit uh, neo-colonial. I mean, uh, like, uh, uh, indeed, uh, there is like a, a surge, uh, like a 
uh, investments uh, arrive in the country, uh, etc. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, like uh, countries are like I would say the uh, uh, these countries are like uh, in the lower value-added part of the chain, and it's not the way they will develop. They are just uh, putting themselves in uh, dependency of like countries who are ordering the value chain somewhere else. And uh, like this Chinese, uh, I would say not my miracle, but the way Chinese accelerated its development over the past uh, 30 years, uh, it's uh, very impressive. But, uh, but no, the country is as totally rebalanced is developed economic growth on the internal consumption. Uh, this rebalancing happened like uh, around 10 years ago. It just moved away from uh, depending on uh, exports uh, being part of the value chains. Uh, they started to uh, relocalize the production in other uh, South Asian countries, and, and they started to rely more and more on domestic investment and consumption. And uh, and I think that uh, there is uh, in the current situation where there is a real doubt about uh, how will develop the uh, how will develop the global uh, value chains, the global, global supply chains. Uh, countries should do whatever they could to uh, try to generate uh, internal demand and try to be as much as possible uh, self-sufficient uh, in terms of economic development. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I can see there are a few additional comments to thank you for, uh, for your sessions. One final question, calling for a short answer from uh, Shilizi Monai again. What do you think is the global economic balance of power relations? But I believe, I believe uh, Sebastian, it's up to you if you, if you have a really short answer. Otherwise, I would be very happy to host another webinar with you, more around the geopolitics, probably. No, very briefly, uh, I think Europe is very weak. Uh, indeed, like this question has a relevance because, uh, you know, in the past, uh, in the past, uh, like the strength of a country was related to its population and its army, like uh, 18th, 19th century. You know, it's uh, related with the economic strength. I think Europe is very weak because it has no protectionism to its uh, industries uh, and the most powerful countries within Europe is Germany, but they actually totally depend on uh, countries who are importing their uh, products because uh, Germany is totally kind of, its economy is mercantilist, totally focused on exporting. So basically they totally depend on what the Chinese and US will buy from them. So anytime U.S. are annoyed by Germany for any reason. They start to threaten to put tariffs on the cars, and uh, like 25% on uh, German cars imports. And Germany is like so scared, but they do whatever the U.S. wants, and takes and Germany takes the whole EU with it. So basically, uh, to answer your question, first thing, Europe is weak, extremely weak in terms of uh, geo strategical uh, influence, and it is uh, it is right now. Uh, Indeed, a kind of like uh, opposition between the U.S. and, uh, let's say, U.S.-led group of countries and, uh, and Chinese-led group of countries. Uh, and I think this uh, situation is extremely worrisome. It's worrisome in terms of, uh, for people who are obsessed with trade, it is, uh, it is a concern uh, economically. Um, I think it can have positive externalities in terms of uh, reshoring and relocalization of, uh, of production. Uh, and uh, as we said, for China, it's less dramatic now to have problems with international trade because they largely rebalance their economy into domestic consumption. So they can be more self-assertive. We are not in the situation of Germany anymore. Like 10, 20 years ago, if the U.S. started to be annoyed with China, they would threaten to stop the, like, uh, the production in China, and China would be very scared. But now it's much less scary for them. So they are kind of liberated themselves from this uh, dependency. So I'm extremely concerned in terms of like purely uh, like uh, geostrategic uh, terms of this uh, kind of radical uh, uh, like uh, exaggeration of the uh, antagonism between the US uh, and China. And it's uh, I would say very sudden. I mean. Uh, uh, like uh, there is kind of, uh, I would say, close to racism uh, against uh, China, which is emerging very fast, and I think it's uh, it's uh, scary and uh, and worrisome. And so we'll see how it goes, but uh, we are indeed in very uncertain times. 
And uh, thank you very much for your time. Indeed, uh, Sebastian, for the very thoughtful analysis. Thank you for the participants who stayed with us uh, until, uh, until the end and for their, for their questions. Hope you enjoyed uh, the, the event. Thank you. Thank you very much from my side to everyone.